And now we'll get into some preaching. Take your Bibles and let's go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. All right. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. I'm, I'm going deaf. Pray for me for real. I'm going deaf in this ear. And, uh, and the reason why is because this is the side that my wife sits on when I'm driving. And uh, anyway, <laughs> I really am going deaf in this ear, though, so pray for me. I don't know. I, maybe there's some, uh, I don't know. You know, sometimes you get something down on the eardrum and it doesn't vibrate correctly. So anyway, uh, going deaf doesn't sound like that bad of a thing to me. Uh, anyway, I try to, some of you parents know what I'm talking about. Say amen. Uh, going, going, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but now, so come again. Anyway, uh, but uh, I'm going deaf in this, so I want to make sure everybody can hear me okay. All right, say, Philippians, Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. Let's all stand for just a moment in reverence to the reading of God's word, Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 5. The Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Every major translation will change that. That clearly tells you that Jesus was equal with God because he was God. He didn't think it was robbery to be equal with God. In fact, John 10, 33 says that he made himself equal with God. That's why the Jews wanted to stone him. Verse 7, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Let me give you some Andrew Sutter theology. Jesus Christ was not a man like me and you as an, or a man. He was 100% man, but he wasn't, like a man, he wasn't a man like me and you. He had different blood, according to Acts chapter 20. He had the blood of God. His very DNA was different. He had different DNA even. All right, look at verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Yeshua, is that what it says? At the name of of Yahweh, is that what it says? No, it says in my King James English text, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I want to bump your attention back up to verse 8 where the Bible says this, the last half of the verse, that he became obedient unto death. And not just death. He didn't become obedient just to die. But even the death of the cross. I'm going to preach to you tonight on the death of the cross. The death of the cross. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. Lord, thank you for letting us be in church tonight. Lord, I absolutely cannot do anything without you. Father, if you do not help me, I, I cannot convey a message to these people. So, Lord, I pray that you get me out of the way. Lord, I pray that you'd humble me. Lord, I pray that you would hide me behind your cross tonight. Lord, I pray that something done or said might impact somebody for eternity. We love you and we thank you for all that you're doing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, I think you can be seated. The death of the cross. Now, um, Jesus, when he died, as Pastor alluded to it a little bit before, before I came up, but Jesus' death is very important the way that he died. Uh, John MacArthur, the great heretic and Calvinist and ESV promoter, New King James promoter, I had an independent Baptist preacher tell me today that he listens to John MacArthur, and why anybody would listen to John MacArthur, I'm not real sure, and if you do, you need to find you some better preachers to listen to. But uh, John MacArthur said several years ago that it wasn't the, the blood of Jesus that was important, but it was the death of Jesus, and his death is what mattered and not necessarily the mode or way that he died. Well, friend, can I say this to you, that Hebrews 9, 21, or excuse me, 22 says that without the shedding of blood is no remission. And Jesus Christ, uh, it's not just the fact that he died, but he had to die by bloodshed. There had to be blood. If he had upped and died of a heart attack, me and you wouldn't be here today, amen? It's not just about his death, but it is about the way he died because he had to die by bloodshed. The Bible says this in the book of Colossians, uh, that he made peace by the what? Blood of his cross. It's, a, it's not just about the cross. It's 
about the blood of the cross. It's the fact that the cross means that he shed his blood. Now, when we look here at Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 8, we find that the Bible mentions that he humbled himself. He became as a servant. The Bible says he became obedient unto death. Now, I know that doesn't say to death. The Bible says, Blessed is he that endureth temptation, for when he has tried, he shall receive what? The crown of life, which the Lord hath promised them that love them. I think I got, well, what, is, what is that verse? James 1, 12. Blessed is man that endureth temptation, for when he has tried, he shall receive the crown of life. I think that's what it is. Somebody check me on that. While you're checking me, I'll continue preaching. And so the crown of life there, not only is the crown of life given to those who are faithful in temptation. Somebody got it, Liam, you got it? Read it for me real loud. Okay, I was right. All right, there you go. The Lord had promised them that loved, uh, that loved him. But not only do we find the crown of life given to those who are uh, uh, who are endure, who endure temptation, but Revelation chapter 2 says that the crown of life is given unto those who are faithful unto death. Now, that doesn't mean that they're faithful to death. You're faithful to God until you die. It's you're faithful in God, and you're going to die because of unto death. Does everybody, everybody follow me here? Now, notice, the Bible says that he was obedient unto death. It didn't mean he was obedient until he died, but he was obedient to the point where his obedience meant he was going to die. And it clarifies this statement and says not just obedient to the point where he's going to die because of it, but he's going to be obedient to the point where he has to die the death of the cross. Now, folks, the death of the cross is a very agonizing thing. In fact, it was probably the greatest form of death ever thought of in man's mind. If you'll go to uh, uh, Psalms chapter 22, Psalms chapter 22, this is a messianic psalm. We find in Psalms chapter 22, it's interesting, Psalms 22 deals with uh, the crucifixion. Psalms 23 deals with the, uh, the resurrection or the current state of Jesus. And Psalm 24 deals with the coming of Jesus. So you find the good shepherd in Psalms 22. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd does what? Lay down his life for the sheep. You have Psalm 22, the crucifixion. Then Jesus said, Psalm, Psalms 23, 1 says, Lord is my shepherd. Jesus said, I am the what? The great shepherd. The Bible says the great shepherd of our souls. So Jesus is the great shepherd in Psalms 23. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse, or 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 4, when the chief shepherd shall appear. So Psalms 24 deals with his coming. So you see the good shepherd, the great shepherd, and then one day he's going to be the chief shepherd. Somebody say amen. Now watch this. Psalms chapter 22. I want us to notice here some details. Psalms 22 gives us some details about the cross. Look at verse number 1 of Psalms 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. But thou art holy, and O oh thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee, and were delivered. They trusted in thee, and were not confounded. But I am a what? Worm. There are some commentators that believe that when Jesus Christ was dying on the cross, the hours of darkness that were upon the face of the earth, that his literal form on the cross literally became a worm. What does the Bible say? Jesus said in John 13, 14, or excuse me, John 3, 14, that even as Moses lifted up the what? Serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. The Bible says that he who knew no sin did what? became sin for us. So Jesus was made sin. What does sin look like? Some commentators believe it looks like a worm. Interesting stuff. He said, but I, Job, Job said that his mother, when he was going through his agony, he said, my mother is a worm. Look what it says there. But I am a worm and no man. It said, and no man. Could it be that while Jesus is hanging there on the cross between heaven and earth that 
he literally changes his own form and literally becomes sin. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him, let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. And if you'll cross-reference that over to Mark chapter 15, you'll find the Pharisees and the people walking by. The Bible says, wagging their head, saying that very thing. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. If you study your Bibles, you understand that many demonic spirits and entities will appear as animals. Some commentaries or commentators, and by the way, you know what a commentator is, don't you? Just a commentator, okay? But some commentators think that literally there were demonic forces all around Jesus in the forms of bulls. Notice what it says in verse 13. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. What did they do with Stephen when Stephen's preaching to them? I, now listen, I, I, I've never bit a man. I, I've never got so mad at somebody I just grabbed him and bit him. Okay, that's what toddlers do. But the Bible says in Acts chapter 7 that those Pharisees became so infuriated by the message of Stephen, the Bible says they gashed upon him with their teeth. The Bible says there was the same thing going on at the crucifixion, but by bulls. By bulls. Who are these bulls? I don't know. We, I, I have to chalk it up to their being... De Listen, can you imagine when Jesus is being led to the cross, the amount of demonic activity ensuring that he got to the cross, not knowing that it was the very cross that would defeat them? Let's continue on. Look at what it says. I'm, verse, verse 14, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. Now, are we Bible believers... So what does the word all mean, boys and girls? All. Any Calvinists in here? Don't raise your hand. God help us. But the word all means all. All means all, and that's all all means. So for Bible believers, the Bible tells us in Psalms 22 that every joint that the Lord had when he was being crucified was out. Now, what happens, have you ever, have you ever tensed up so badly that you, you started, you, you, your joints started popping out? Have you ever gotten so tense? that you started, you started uh, cramping up. It happens when in times of extreme stress. And literally as they're beating him and tugging on him and all the different things, literally every joint that the Lord has, all the way down to his toes and his feet and his hands, every joint he has is out of place. Anybody ever rolled your shoulder wrong and it, popped and it was sore. Man, I tell you what, I did that one night when I was sleeping. I woke up screaming. I thought I was dying. I thought somebody had ripped my arm off. And I sat, I mean, I was sore for days. The next day, all, all I could do was just lay on the couch. Man, I was hurting. Anytime I moved, it hurt. Now, can you imagine every joint the Lord has being out of place? Every one of them. As he's being beaten and spit upon a mock. We'll get, we'll get to that in just a moment. But every, every one of them out of place. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. Under times of extreme stress, the heart, and having a heart attack, sometimes the heart will literally begin to melt. It will literally begin to just kind of de deteriorate and disintegrate. That's why when they stabbed the Lord's side, what came out? Water and blood. Where'd the water come from? That's a sign of heart failure. Verse 15, my strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my what? Jaws. What's one of the seven sayings of the cross? I thirst. You ever been so thirsty? I remember one time I was roofing, 
and I was out on a, and it was hot, and the guy had left me alone on the roof, and and uh, and I, I became so dehydrated, got a headache, and literally my tongue. You ever you ever been so thirsty it felt like your tongue was you know the size of you know a baseball bat? You're just, man, my tongue started sticking to the roof of my mouth, and I mean it just felt like you know just it was terrible. And li- hey, listen. And I began to look around and looking for a, 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 a water spigot, and they didn't have one. So I was out in the middle of nowhere. There was a house over across the way in the woods, and said, "Man, I'm going to get shot, but I'm going to go over there and drink out of their hose." I didn't know if anybody was home or not, and so I knocked on the door. Nobody was home, so I started drinking out of the hose, and and got some water. But guys, can you imagine the Lord Jesus Christ? See, when you're under extreme physical stress, being beaten or whatever. You sweat, you exert a lot of energy, and a lot of moisture begins to come out of the pores and all that. And so at blood loss, and, and as he's being beaten and all that, the Bible says that he cried out on the cross, I thirst. The Bible says in Psalms 22 that his thirst was so great, he was so dehydrated, and his mouth was so dry and parched, that his tongue literally began to cleave to the sides of his jaws. Verse 15, my tongue, my strength is dried up like a pot, and my tongue cleaved to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands, my feet. I don't know how a Jew can read Psalms 22 and miss it. In fact, Psalms 22 is one of the forbidden chapters. I'll, you can look that up on your own time. Verse 17 is an amazing verse to me. Look at verse 17. I may tell all my what? Bones. They look and stare upon me. Now, folks, this is incomprehensible to my human mind. Now, the Bible's, now what does the Bible say? The Bible says in Isaiah 51 that his visage was so, maybe Isaiah 52, his visage was so marred that you couldn't even tell it was a man. As they were, as Jesus was hanging on the cross, people would walk by and say, there's a man on that side, there's a man on that side, what's that thing hanging in the middle? You couldn't even tell it was a man. It looked like a piece of meat hanging on a cross. And the Bible said, gives us a detail about that. Not only was every joint in his body out of place, but the Bible says every bone he had was exposed. Every bone he had was exposed. That means think of a single bone in your body, and that bone would have been showing at the time of Jesus' death. The skull, the neck, the ribs, the the spine, the the tailbone, the pelvis bone, the legs, the kneecap, all of it, every bit of it exposed in one place or another. Look what it said. We're Bible believers, aren't aren't we? I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Great fulfillment happened when they took that purple linen and broke it up and cast lots for it. Verse 19, but be not far, but be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength. Haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling, from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of, of the unicorns. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All ye the seed of Israel. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he... Now, I want to stop there. We're going to come back to this chapter. I want you to get a glimpse about the death of the cross. When Jesus is delivered up to Pilate, and the Bible says he's standing before Pilate, and I know we're not, we're not in shouting mode yet or whatever, but this is a very sombering message. Stay with me, because I, I, I'm going to be in a little bit of a teaching mode, and then, we're going to, and then I'll get to kind of where I'm going. I'm not going to be long tonight, I promise. But as he's standing before Pilate, and he He's looking there, and Pilate's asking these questions. Pilate's wife has already said, I had a dream, Pilate. Don't you have anything to do with the blood of this citizen? Don't you have anything to do with this man? He's innocent. They, he's done nothing. Don't you have anything to do with them? 
And Pilate, of course, says, Behold your king. And they say, We have the Jews say, We have no king but Caesar. We have no king but Caesar. And he said, Well, who do you want me to release unto you, Jesus or Barabbas? And they said, Barabbas, Barabbas. And, and he says, What should I do with this innocent man? And they said, Crucify him, crucify him. Same crowd that was saying, Hosanna, blesses he that cometh to the name of the Lord a week earlier. They said, Crucify him, crucify him. And he said, but this man's done nothing. And they said, his blood be upon us and upon our children. Do you make sure that it's a, if, if, he's, if he's the son of God, make sure you hold us accountable for it. We want him dead. 2,000 years of Jewish history has showed the blood of Jesus Christ is on their hands. They've been driven out of every country they've been in. They've been persecuted. They've been killed. The Inquisition, the Holocaust. And one day during the tribulation, the final judgment of the Jew, nine-tenths of the Jewish population will be completely wiped out during the tribulation period. The Antichrist will hunt them down like dogs. And their blood has been, his blood has been upon their hands and upon their children. He sent him for Pilate. Pilate delivers him into the hands of the Jews. They lead him, the Roman soldiers lead him away. But first they scourge him. Now, I'm going to give you some things you probably already know tonight, but stay with me because you need to be reminded of it. They take him away to scourge. How many of y'all saw the movie The Passion of the Christ? Wicked. No, I'm kidding. I saw it as well. I saw it as well. That movie did not do justice to what the Lord went through. You know why? You know why? How many of y'all remember when Jesus is being whipped and the Roman soldiers counting? Remember he's counting? One, you know, he's doing it in whatever language they spoke in the movie. But that's, that's biblically inaccurate. If you study your Bible, the book of Exodus, chapter 21, if I'm not mistaken, I just came through there. I'm, in, I'm in, uh, getting ready to start Leviticus, but I just came through there. I believe it's Exodus 21. talks about the law for beating a servant. You could only beat a man with 40 stripes. Now, if you read the Pauline epistles, Paul often talks about being beat 40 save 1. That means 39 stripes. And the, the tradition of the Jews was you beat them 39 times in case you miscounted, you would not go over the 40 mark and break the law. Because then you had to free the slave. Guys, what you need to understand is he wasn't beaten by Jews. He was beaten by Romans. They had no law for 40 stripes. They had no law for how many times a man could be hit. And they had what was called a cat of nine tails. A leather, a leather whip with nine leather strips on it. And at the end of those leather strips would be bones and glass and pieces of metal. And as they would whip a man, that thing would, they'd whip him and it would twirl around his body or you know, grass, and as they would pull that thing back, the flesh, flesh would rip out off the body. And literally, you could just about fillet a man with that cat and nine tails. Most people didn't even survive the beating. And the only, I think one of the only reasons Jesus did is because he was God. Most men did not survive the beating. And if they did, it was not uncommon for their organs to be hanging out of their body. And in fact, here's a little bit of Bible truth for you, if Jesus is the Passover lamb, his organs would have had to have been out of his body when he went to the cross. Because the Passover lamb cannot be sacrificed with the internal organs in the body. That's the book. You say, how did he survive without his organs? Preacher, he's God, he can do whatever he wants to. He doesn't die until he gives up the ghost. As they beat him and scourged him, the Bible says. They took the crown of thorns. Anybody ever been to Israel? Anybody ever been to the Holy Land? You have? Brother, did you see the thorns over there? Did they show you the thorn bushes? Guys, we have thorns that big that get stuck in us and get caught in our britches. We get caught in a, a briar patch and all that. Guys, the thorns over there are that long and they're as hard as nails. The Bible says that they plaited a crown of thorns. This wasn't, this wasn't a little, this wasn't a little flower 
uh, flower crown that somebody just folded together. When it talks about they plaited a crown of thorns, some be, even believe that it was similar to an entire football-looking helmet type of thing that would have gone on his head. A crown, and they didn't just put it on his head. The Bible says they took a reed and they smote him on the head and drove that crown of thorns down into his head. The Bible says that they plucked his beard. Now, guys, they didn't take tweezers and individually remove it. Handfuls being ripped out of his face. No doubt removing chunks off of flesh off the cheeks. The Bible says that they spit upon him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Hail, King of the Jews. I tell you what, the next time he comes... They won't be saying it mockingly. The Bible says they put that robe on him and mocked him. And guys, if you have an open wound, guess what starts to happen to that open wound? It starts to heal automatically. It starts to coagulate. And no doubt that dried, bloodied robe on his back as they're leading him up to Calvary they took that and they ripped it off his body, opening every wound on his back that began to heal. See, these are aspects of the crucifixion we don't think about, right? I'm talking to you tonight about the death of the cross. The death of the cross. And the Bible says that he had his cross there. And, folks, this wasn't just some, this wasn't just a, a little dogwood tree, you know, the tradition. I don't know how it is out here, but in the south he died on a dogwood, you know. Rough pieces of timber. The cross, no doubt, weighing anywhere from 150 to 200 pounds. After he'd been beaten within an inch of his life, they laid that cross on him and he begins to walk up Calvary. The Bible says there was one by the name of Cyrene. The Bible says they compelled him to carry his cross. And as he's walking up Calvary, he stumbles underneath that cross. And here comes Simon. He begins to bear that cross with Jesus. They lead him up Calvary. I've been there. I've been to the place where the Lord was crucified. There's a Muslim graveyard on top of it now. It's right beside, a, right beside an it's, it's It's almost ironic. The place where the sin of the world was, was paid for is a Muslim graveyard there now. And right beside it's a little Arab, a little Arab bus station. There was a bunch of Muslims got in a big fight down there while we were there. They passed by it every day on their way to work and on their way to the mosque and wherever. You know what that reminded me of? The McCainies used to sing an old song, You can be close to the cross but far from the blood. And you can look there on the side of that mountain. You can see it. There's a skull there. It's a, it's a skull. It looks just like a skull. Golgotha, four times in the Bible, every, every, every gospel contains the crucifixion account. Three times it uses the word Golgotha, which is a Jewish word, which means the place of the skull. But one time on the one time in your King James Bible, the word Calvary is found, and that's Luke 23, 33. And thank God that's a Gentile word. It's a Greek word. You know what that means? That means when Luke's pinning it down under inspiration of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost says, Luke, let's not write Golgotha there. That's a Jewish word. Let's write Calvary. That's a Gentile word. That does something to me. It does something to me. They lead him up there, and finally they get up to the cross, and, and the Bible says that he's stripped naked. He, he doesn't have a stitch of clothing on his body. You know why he's naked? Is because the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 13 that every creature will be open and naked before his eyes. Well, me and you stand before God. Not to get vulgar or anything, but the Bible says that all things are open and naked before him. And so when he's standing before God, being judged for the sin of the world, not a stitch of clothing on his body. The Bible says that he's hung there between two malefactors, thieves. He's crucified amongst the common criminals. If you study your Bible right, you find out that both of those thieves started out mocking him and, 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 and railing him. The Bible says one said, If he be the Son of God, take us down from here. The Bible says then the other one cast the same in his teeth. I don't know what happened to that one thief. I don't know what happened to him. But somewhere between casting the same in his teeth and 
And, and by the end of Jesus' uh, time on the cross, he cries out and said, Lord, remember me when thou enterest into thy kingdom. Hang in there. And see, here's the thing about the cross. The, the common way of death on the cross was asphyxiation, suffocating to death. Because the way they positioned that thing, the way you were hanging, you had to push up to get a breath. Now imagine having a nail through both of your feet and having to push up on that nail just to get a breath. Crucifixion usually lasted three or four days. Jesus only lasted nine hours. Or is it six hours? Nine or six, huh? I can't remember. Y'all can look it up later. It's nine or six hours. I can't remember. I think it's nine. But anyway. And he's hanging there between heaven and earth. And the seven, you have the seven sayings on the cross. Of course, the first one being, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I thirst. Mother, behold thy son. Son, behold thy mother. Talking about John the disciple, John the beloved, and, and Mary, the mother of Jesus. You have, I, uh, you have um, uh, uh, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You have today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Then you have the victory cry, it is finished. And then you have, Father, into thy hands do I commend my spirit. And the Bible says that God, listen, you know why there was darkness on, on Calvary, don't you? Because, listen, God was literally stamping out the light of the world. Literally stamping out the light of the world. You know what I can't understand? You know what I can't understand about the crucifix, the death of the cross? You know what I can't understand about it? The most awful death anybody ever died was the death that Jesus died. The most awful death. You know what I can't understand about it? Isaiah chapter 53 says that the Lord was the one that did that to Jesus. God the Father did that to God the Son. That's what it says. Go back and yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Not only was it God the Father doing it, God the Son. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says it pleased him. Guys, I can't even stand for my sons to not bump their heads or to get a fever. Your Bible says that it Please the Lord to bruise him. It made him happy. It made him glad. It pleased him. This may be heresy, and if it is, you can correct me later, Brother Dow, but it almost looks like God loved me more than he did his own son. I don't know any other way to explain it. And he dies, and before he dies, there's a man that gets in. That thief on the cross. I can imagine the thief on the cross showing up in paradise. And, and Now, this is the Andrew Suter theology, all right? So th this ain't in the Bible. This is in the ASV, the Andrew Suter version. But I can imagine Noah being there and, and all of them talking, and, 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 and Noah, the guy asks, you're Noah. How did you get here? Well, I built an ark. world's going to be flooding, I built an ark. That's my story. Who are you? Oh, I'm Elijah. I did all these miracles. Well, who are you? Well, I'm Abraham. I, I was going to sacrifice my own son. Well, who are you? You know, I'm Daniel. I was in the line. You know, whatever. And then they say, who are you? I was so-and-so. What did you do? I stole, and I was a thief, and I was a murderer. Well, how would you get here? See that guy over there? <laughs> See that guy right there that just showed up saying he's God? Yeah. I asked him if I could come. <laughs> I know y'all are Nebraskans. Y'all don't shout, but I feel pretty good right now. Whew, man. 
I asked him if I could come, and he said yes. <laughs> he said yes. And Jesus empties out paradise three days later when he rises from the dead. We don't have time to get it all down. What I want you to grasp tonight, what I want you to understand is that Jesus did every bit of that for you and me. Every bit of it for you and me. We could, boy, I could get deep tonight. I could, I could get, I, I, I thought, you know, he asked me to preach on the cross. He said, maybe I'll, I'll, preach, a, I'll preach a deep theological message on the, the comparisons between Calvary and the day of the Lord. At the day of the Lord, there's going to be an earthquake. At Calvary, there was an earthquake. At the day of the Lord, the Bible says there's going to be a day of darkness. Calvary was a day of darkness. The Bible says it's dark on the face of the earth. The Bible says that at the day of the Lord, the rocks will rent. At Calvary, the rocks rent. The Bible says on the day of the Lord, they shall look upon him whom they've pierced. On the day of Calvary, they look upon him whom they've pierced. So many similarities there. The day of Calvary was, uh, was God's wrath upon the Savior. The day of the Lord is God's wrath upon the sinner. Think all about all that. I thought maybe, maybe I'll talk about, uh, about the comparison of the crucifixion with the curse of, 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 of Adam and Eve. If you study that out, you've got at, what, what happened to the earth when Adam sinned? It was cursed with what? Thorns. What did Jesus wear on his head? Crown of thorns. The Bible says that no sacrifice could be on the ground. The ground is cursed because of Adam, so Jesus Christ was lifted up off the earth. What does the Bible say? Part of the curse is that man will eat bread by the what? Sweat of his brow. What? When did Jesus start shedding his blood? Garden of Gethsemane. His sweat became great drops of blood. Boy, we can get into all that about how Jesus was the second Adam. But man, I could not get away from the fact that he was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. If we ever get to a place in our lives where we fail to remember what Jesus did on the cross. I want you to go. I want, we're going to go to one place and then we're going to be back in Psalms 22. Keep your finger in Psalms 22. I want you to go to Colossians chapter 1. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Hebrews 12, Hebrews 12. I already mentioned Colossians 1.20 is a good one too. Having a peace through the blood of his cross. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. Look what it says there in Hebrews 12. In fact, let us look at, let's look at verse 1. Hebrews 12, 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto who? Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the what? What joy? The joy that was set before him. What was the joy that was set before him? Endured the cross. The Bible says that the cross was a joy for Jesus. I don't understand that. I don't understand that. The only thing I can get grasped is James 1 4, or is it James? Yeah, James 1 4. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. I don't understand that. For the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. He endured the cross, and he was it, he counted it as a joy for me and you. Go back to Psalms 22, and I'll be done now. Psalms 22, and I'll be done. I could keep I could keep you here for another hour talking about this, but I'm not gonna. Don't worry. Go back to Psalms 22. We're gonna be done. We find in Psalms 22 all the details of the crucifixion, all the things that was going on in the crucifixion. 
Now look at what it says there. And we're going to skip a few verses for sake of time. Verse number 30. A seed shall what? Serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a what? Now what is a generation? The group of people that are born, right? Your father and your mother generated you. The Bible talks about us being regenerated. That's where the old phrase, uh, born once, die twice, born twice, die once. You must be what? Born again. First John chapter 3 talks about a saved person, the seed of God remains in him and he cannot sin for his sin remaineth in him. That doesn't mean about your body. We all sin, but talking about the soul, that the blood of Christ seals the soul, and now your soul cannot sin. Somebody say amen. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be what? Born. What are they going to declare? That he hath done this. I want you to know tonight, you say, preacher, are you Generation X? Are you a millennial? You know, all that kind of stuff. I want you to know, I don't know what generation I'm part of, Generation X, Y, Z, whatever, millennial. But I know one generation I'm a part of. I'm part of the generation of the cross. You're looking, you're looking now at a direct result of Calvary. You're looking at a direct seed that was generated by what Jesus Christ did on the cross. You're looking at a direct, listen, you're looking at a direct descendant of Jesus Christ. See, oh, uh, old Dan Brown had it wrong with the Da Vinci Code. See, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ did have children, but it sure wasn't by Mary Magdalene. It was by the Holy Ghost and the incorruptible seed of the Word of God. Somebody say amen. A generation shall be born, and they shall declare that he hath done this. Hey, guys, let me wrap it all up here, and I'm done tonight. You know what the last thing I want to do? The last thing I want to do is forget about what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross. And the next to last thing I don't want to do is forget to tell somebody what he did on the cross. What a Savior we serve. What a God we have. My, 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 what he did for us on the cross. I could never repay what Jesus did for me on the cross. He did something for me I never could do for myself. If I would have died, I'd have gotten justice. I should have been on the cross. I should have been the one dying. I should have been the one that was crucified. I deserve to die and go to hell forever and ever and ever. But thank God he took my place. And thank God he did. Listen, if I'd have died, I'd have gotten justice. But because an innocent man died, now there can be mercy. And thank God I'm a recipient of what he did. But listen, Brother Dow, people like me don't get to go to heaven. But I found out about whosoever will. See, people like me don't get to go to heaven. But God said, whosoever will, and I found out about it. <laughs> I got in under the whosoever will clause. If I had to pay my way to heaven, I couldn't make it. I'm as poor as they come. If I had to be good, to, if I had to work my way into heaven, I never could make it. I sin every day. Thank God he did something for me I couldn't do for myself. And he died in my place. He took my sin and my penalty. And I want to tell the world that I'm, listen, I want to tell the world about what Jesus did for me. Well, I'm so glad, I, I don't know about you, but I'm so glad I'm saved tonight. I'm just glad I'm born again. Couldn't go to hell if I wanted to.